Last week, I started telling you about Chief Pontiac, the Napoleon of the North. And I want to continue with that this week. And this week, uh, come on, Comp Foxy. Ay, ay, ay. Start again. Hush. Thank you. All right, try it again. Welcome, my friends. Last week, I began telling you about Chief Pontiac, who was uh, known as something of a Napoleon of the Northern uh, Woodland Indians. He was a powerful leader. And uh, I want to pick up where we left off last week. So let's get right into it. Pontiac was principal chief of the Ottawas and head of a loose confederacy of Ottawas, Ojibwas, and Potawatomis. He was about 50 years of age, tall, sinewy, and strong. Over those around him, his authority was almost despotic. While his name was known and respected among all the Sat Indians uh, who resided in the country, stretching from the Ohio River to the lowest waters of the Mississippi, he possessed great energy, crafty, craftiness, and oratorical power, prowess. While, he was, while his courage in war was far famed, it is said that he commanded the Ottawas in the defeat of General Braddock at Fort Desquain during the French and Indian War. Uh, and it is certain that he treat, was treated with much honor by the French officers, for one of them had presented him with the regimentals of a soldier of that country, which he, which is, he is uh, only known to have won upon one occasion. Not long before the beginning of the French Indian War, he had saved the French garrison at Detroit for, from an attack uh, from some disconnected tribes of the North who had marched to destroy it. For this, he had, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for this, he had been, uh, he had been uh, made much of by the French officers. He put, uh, Major Rogers was quoted as saying, he puts on an air of majesty and princely grandeur and is greatly honored and revered by his subjects. Pontiac saw that the Indian race was now confronted with a grave crisis for when Canada had become an English province, uh, the tribes had sunk from their uh, former position of importance. Up to this time, France and England, the two rival European nations, had kept each other in check upon the American continent, and the Indians had been flattered by each, for their services were indeed much needed by both. Now, the English had gained undisputed control of America, and the Indians, being no longer important as allies, were treated as animals of a lower order of intellect who could be trampled upon with impunity. And that's a... Uh, leaving the book for a second, and that's something that carried on uh, through through the th through the years uh, until you know the Native American tribes were almost exterminated with smallpox that was foisted upon them by uh, yeah by traders and such. Anyways, um, thus the mind of the wily Ottawa chief conceived the idea of driving the English into the sea of once more restoring the French to power in the West, and thus to again place the Indians in their former position of influence. Now, the French Canadians, of whom I'm descended, by the way, uh, the French Canadians continually told him falsehoods, assuring him that the war had not been lost by the French, that the armies of King Louis were now on their way to recover Canada, and that, Fran or that French and their red allies could soon drive the hated English away from their beloved country. Stirred by these lies and urged on by revenge, ambition, and patriotism, Pontiac decided upon war. The various Indian tribes which lived along the Mississippi and the country of the Ohio River and its many tributaries, and along the cold waters of the Ottawa to the north, were visited in 1762 by ambassadors from Pontiac. <clears throat> They carried with them a tomahawk stained red and a war belt of wampum, and as they went from camp to camp, they would fling down the tomahawk on the ground, hold the war belt above their heads, and deliver a, a long speech urging the warriors to join them in the extermination of the English. Everywhere this appeal was heard, with nods of and gest gesticulations of approval, and all the Algonquin nation, including the Wyandots, the Senecas, and several tribes of the lower Mississippi pledged themselves to aid in this important movement. 
of the powerful Iroquois nation of New York State, only the Senecas would join, but the force against the whites was so overwhelming that it seemed hardly possible that a few scattered English garrisons could escape a terrible slaughter. Yet, confident in the supreme race confidence, which has made the English the most all-powerful nation since the Roman Legion, at the time of the publication of this book, held dominion over the greater part of Europe, the white garrisons and of the wilderness kept their posts in fancied peace and seclusion. The dreary winter drew to a close, and the Indians hid their intentions behind them and serious countenances. They still lounged about the forts, they begged for tobacco, gunpowder, and whiskey, and gave no sign of intended wrong or violence. Yet, they were busy sawing the muzzles of their guns in half so that they could conceal them underneath their blankets, uh, and were gathering a large supply of powder and ammunition from the French traders, and were holding war dances in their far distant habitation. Now and again, imitations of their, da of their danger reached the garrisons and startled, startled them from their fancied security. An English trader came into Detroit one day and reported that he had heard a half-breed sounded, uh, excuse me, a half-breed scoundrel boast that before the next summer he would have English scalp locks as a fringe to his hunting shirt. The commander of the garrison laughed at the tale, and later, in March 1763, the British commander Holmes at Fort Miami on the Maumee River, about 190 miles southwest of Detroit, was told of Pontiac's conspiracy by a friendly Indian, and he said, the warriors of the neighboring village have received a war belt and blood-stained hatchet with a message urging them to destroy you and your soldiers. If you did not kill them first, they will do so, he told, uh, he told him. And Holmes believed the tale call, uh, called the, the, and called the warriors together and told them of his suspicions. And the savages acted as many of them uh, have done under similar circumstances, confessed that they had meditated an attack upon the garrison, said that neighboring tribe had told them they must do it under pain of death, and professed, professed eternal love and goodwill towards the hated English. <laughs> this allayed the suspicions of the commander at Fort Maumee, but he reported his discovery to Major Gladwin at Detroit, who, seeing the peaceful condition of the Indians in the three villages near his own fort, expressed the opinion that there was apparently some trouble among the Indians, but that it would soon blow over and he little suspected that Pontiac, the arch-conspirator, was in a village but a short distance away, and that his heart was burning with revenge and hate against him and his small garrison. And he believed that as the savages came in from their winter hunting grounds uh, on the approach of spring and did not come into the fort as usual, they were fast-making preparations for an assault upon him. And in a few weeks, he was to learn more of the Indian's character than he had ever suspected. I think we will stop there this week, um, and next week we'll, we're going to get into some more exciting uh, uh, events of this particular period uh, that will pull in uh, a great deal of a great deal of scalps for the Native Americans. I hope you uh, found this interesting and informative. Uh, these are events that took place right where we live, uh, If well, Michiganders, I'm sorry, right where we live, down in the Detroit area, and uh, eventually on up, you know, further north. So anyways, again, I hope you enjoyed this. I will see you all again real soon, and uh, God willing, I will see you again real soon, that is. It's up to him. I love you all very much, and God bless. <laughs>